Right, well, we better get pretty much started because we've got um, three excellent speakers this evening and we want to have time for questions and answers and discussion afterwards. So I'll just very briefly introduce them all three in order and then after that you'll just have to get up and take your turns without too much problem from me. So um, the first speaker is Professor Jeremy Black, MBE, uh, and he's Professor of History at Exeter University. He's also a senior fellow at the, study for the, at the Center for the Study of America and the West at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. And I saw him only a month or two ago fronting a program on television, I don't remember which channel it was, uh, about the Industrial Revolution. He's also the author of an extraordinary number of books, um, I think well over a hundred, um, which claims to be some sort of uh, world record. Um, so if you want to buy all these books, you want I to get... certainly don't suggest that. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, you're going to need deep pockets if you want to buy all of uh, Professor Black's books. Um, and then our second speaker will be Dr. John Steele. Uh, he is a lecturer in journalism studies at the University of Sheffield. Um, and his specialty, which he covered in his PhD, um, was freedom of speech and its ideological components in early to mid 19th century radical newspapers and pamphlets. So again, we will get plenty of historical context from Dr. Steele, I'm sure. And our third speaker, uh, Inko Kobayashi, will bring the discussion more uh, onto Japan. Um, and uh, she is a journalist um, and worked uh, for the Daily Yomiuri um, and uh, writes for various Japanese media outlets at the moment, based, based in London, um, and has written a book uh, called The Power of the Financial Times, so she's uh, very much an author about journalism as well, also a history of the British media. She also translated Boris Johnson's book, Churchill Factor. Um, must have been a labour of love. <laughs> so, um, without any further ado, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting us. Uh, I've only got 20 minutes, so by the nature of things I have to skate. And also, if one's looking, as you all appreciate, if one's looking either at the past or indeed the present or the future of the press, there is a degree of subjectivity as to what seems important and how one interprets it. What I want to try and focus on is a account of the history of the press. I do not by any means suggest it's the only account. There are other people here who are quite able to give you different accounts. But I just want us to, to, to focus on that. And what I want to argue essentially is that what we conventionally see as newspapers, which are um, printed means for the distribution of news and opinion appearing at a regular, uh, regular uh, interval of time, are, are, and they developed, incidentally, if you're interested, in Europe in the 1600s. The first two are generally held to have been published in Buffenbotel and Strasbourg, 1608, 1609, um, London following in about 1621, um, and you know, developing a, at that stage, essentially weekly sequence first London newspaper that's a daily is 1701. So we're talking about you know, a considerable period of time. But what I want to suggest is that in some respects, you know, people today are very apt to argue that, that uh, we're moving into a world in which newspapers are being lost among a melange of uh, social media and, so like, and such like. That in, the, in a way, the press as a form of information, conveying information and opinion, for much of its history was a minority activity. I mean, if you think about it, I've made references to dates in the 17th and 18th century. Well, as of course you'll all be aware, um, in those periods only a minority of the population were literate. Um, and indeed, I think it's fair to say that in, literacy is variously defined uh, on world scales, but I think it's fair to say that you will find very few countries where literacy was close to whatever you might mean by universal um, until either well into the 19th century in the case of some Scandinavian new countries or well into the 20th century in the case of many countries into the world. So by the nature of things, any written medium was always going to be a minority act. Activity. And if it is the case that looking to the future, newspapers become a more clearly minority activity, that is not inherently a, a cause for gloom. And I'd add one other thing, which is a very important point. Uh, people at the present moment are apt to talk about crisis. Any consumer industry at the present moment is operating in the most benign of circumstances. And the simple reason for that is we are in a period of unprecedented growth in the world population. 
We're up at about 7.3 billion at the moment. UN projections, they're only projections, but they've been revised up from the end of the century from 9.5 to 10.75 billion. In that context, quite frankly, even if you are holding a diminishing share of the market, you are likely to be able to go on delivering a profit and go on delivering being significant. I think that's an important way to look at things, that the, the medium of newspapers has always benefited from the fact that um, our, uh, essentially most of the history of the press has, has been in a period of sustained population rise. And in case that seems fanciful as an issue, just think about the implications if the world's population was likely to go down 3 billion from its present figures on the consumption of any consumer product, whether it's beer or newspapers. Now, next point. Because the majority of the world's population at the time that newspapers started were not existing in a literary, in a literate form, they were also people who, on the whole, took their news and opinion within the circumstance of what was immediately around them. Uh, personal mobility was relatively limited. I mean, obviously it existed, one would be naive to ignore that, but it was relatively limited. And essentially, within the context of the village, or indeed uh, even within the context of a town, most people would take their news of what was happening in those communities on a basis of face-to-face -face information. It's no accident that if you look at early newspapers, and indeed if you look at newspapers for a long time, what they essentially tell you about is news are going on somewhere at some considerable distance. Um, the British press, for example, in the 17th century and early 18th century concentrated on news about Europe. Um, indeed, the original development of newspapers in London uh, is, is, uh, exactly matches the start and development of the Thirty Years' War, enormous war on the continent, which uh, England is not involved, but which is regarded as important. And that is what people want to read in their newspapers. They're not interested in reading about, if, you know, if you live in um, uh, Evesham, you're not interested in reading about news in Evesham, because you know that. You know what's happened in Evesham. And newspapers come out, as I've said, either once every two weeks, uh, sorry, twice a week, or uh, once a week in most places. Places. Indeed, I mentioned the first English provincial paper as being a 1701, sorry, first English daily paper being 1701. What I ought to have said at that point is it's only London that has daily papers in the 18th century. Elsewhere in the British world, papers are all weeklies, or at the most uh, bi weeklies. And indeed, on the continent, the normal pattern is for newspapers to be weekly. There are some that are more regular, but that is the normal pattern. If you've got news occurring, one, uh, being published once a week, and you live in a place, you will obviously assume that your information from that place you're going to hear much more quickly than picking it up from a newspaper. And again, if we're looking at long-term patterns, we could argue that where we're doing now is going back to that early situation. Because where did you get your newspaper and your news from in most areas? You got it from discussion with others, you got it from gossip, you got it from whatever was the opinion uh, being held in the particular community, either geographical or institutional, that you lived in, or, you know, uh, um, career path that you lived in. And indeed, in many senses, social media in the present day represents another form of that. It might be speeded up, it might be electronically conveyed, but it's again another form of gossip. And, and everything that one understands about the strengths and weaknesses, the speed and dubious accuracy of those means. So I just put that to you because there's a terrible tendency to take, when we're looking at the uh, change through time, to put the accent on the idea that we never go back to the past. Well, in certain respects, that is true. I mean, you know, in terms of the actual details of the physicality of life, and as I've said, the numbers of people. But in some respects, we're actually reverting to a lot of early patterns. What other points give you an example of that? In the early period of the press, and indeed really until sting-based production systems in the 19th century, and here I'm going to sound like a Marxist, but in, those, uh, in the early period of the press, it was relatively easy for somebody to set up a newspaper. 
And indeed, most newspapers were run not by what we would call newspapers, they were run by jobbing printers. And those jobbing printers, who often made a lot of their money uh, through running out notices, the, the spread of literacy to a certain extent, but more the spread of government use of print, which becomes much more important from the 16th, 17th and 18th century onwards. You know, you put up a notice if you're a government agency, you assume either people can read it or if they can't read it, most of them can't. You're not interested in the views of those who can't, to be blunt. Um, but of course you're setting up Jobbing printers have got these presses all over the place, and it's quite easy for them to test the market by deciding to run off a newspaper and see what happens. A newspaper is generally part of a general printing business. And on top of that, um, the circulation of newspapers. Now, in London, it was very common uh, to buy newspapers from the newspaper office, from people who hawked them on the streets, much of the country outside London, the main means by which a newspaper was distributed was by somebody going round on a news circuit. Okay, I did it on a horse, of course. And of course, classically, the people that went round on the news circuit were also selling books. They were selling generally in England things like shoe polish, the sort of things that you can't get in your local village. So in other words, news production was not a specialised function. It becomes really a specialised function in the 19th century. The steam-driven machinery requires a very different capital uh, investment um, and the pattern changes. But again, you could be arguing, if you wanted to, that in part what we're going back to was ease of entry into disseminating, producing and disseminating news today. That in some respects, and again, this is technologically related and it's culturally related, and I'm sure that you in the audience will have your own views on what is the most important factor. But again, what I would say is that we shouldn't regard the quintessential age of, say, the Daily Mail of the 1890s, you know, um, enormous circulation newspaper, we shouldn't regard that necessarily as, a, as the only form of news production. And if we move away from that, we have a decline. What we should instead be saying is there are different forms, different institutional forms, different commercial forms, different social mediums and contexts within which news is created. But insofar as you're looking at a news business, it's by no means clear what is going to be the best way in order to disseminate that news. Years ago, I uh, had an interview with Andreas Whitam Smith, and you know I was asking him because I was interested in developments of newspapers. The Independent had only recently been founded, of course, there's been demise since. And I asked him what he thought he was trying to do, and he said, "Well, he said for him." The key element was not to produce a newspaper. The key element was to have a tranche of talented staff. And he wasn't clear what would be necessarily the best way for producing the information created or disseminated by the staff. It might be through hard copy, it might well be in the future through computers, or it might well be through radio. He had no idea, and he said he had an open mind. But what I think was interesting about that reflection is it captured the sense that we shouldn't be particularly drawn down to saying there is a fixed form that we have to regard as quality, success, achievement, the way we want to be going, and that if we move away from that fixed form, there is necessarily dissolution and chaos. Um, I myself, I'm sure many people here, are am uneasy about what is much of what is going on, and John is going to talk about aspects of it, so I uh, myself am uneasy, but I've got to always be careful, as we all, all, all ought to be careful, of associating our unease with the idea that it's ipso facto crisis, chaos, decline. I mean, that's the classic approach of a sort of rather small-minded conservatism. It might be on the right politically, it might be on the left, it might be on the centre. I'm not making a political point. But the kind, of, the kind of attitude that it was always somehow better in the past, and that in a way that quality of the past has been thrown away. Well, ironically, people were saying that in the 19th century when steam production came in. 
They were saying that, you know, the same, Dickin, the, Dick, the same view that Dickens had in his famous piece when he talks about the demise of the stagecoach and its replacement by the railway engine. This same idea that there had been an old England which in some way was perfect and it had been replaced by sort of grad grinds and all that sort of thing. So people had those ideas about the construction of the very newspaper world that subsequently we were to idealise and worry about the demise of it. And I dare say this is part and parcel of a nature of social construction of thought, that we always are apt to suggest that the new is disturbing and troubling. But ironically, of course, the press is in fact, or newspapers, or any news media, whether, however it is, is in fact dealing with the new. It would be rather surprising if something that deals with the new should inherently have a conventional, established, and unchanging set of mechanisms for the or understanding, organisation, production, and dissemination of news, and for the social context of that news. And you know, I know this sounds rather odd, but I myself, looking at how my students um, create their own news patterns, much of which I have to tell you deals with gossip and so on, but I have to say, why inherently should they take established news patterns that reflect simply uh, the views of a generation such as mine. If one looks at the actual, the, the, what they're doing, they're tweeting, they're Facebooking, indeed they're, they actually have also a free newspaper which they finance through advertising. Those are all different to conventional media of a certain type. But they do enable large numbers of people to, uh, to develop the habit of articulating their views. You may take the, uh, the, uh, the um, understanding, you may take the, the perception that the very uh, entry into the articulation of views is too easy, that there are too many people allowed to express unfounded opinions, flawed analyses and so on. But I have to tell you, again, that was always argued about the press. You go right the way back to the original discussion of printing. The original discussion of printing was great disturbance about, on the part of many commentators, at the idea that there is going to be this medium existing which challenges the existing uh, patterns of authority and actual content of authority. And of course, if you think about it, notions that were deeply subversive, whether they were to do with how the, how the planets moved, whether they were to do with the notion of tyrannicide, whether they were to do with republicanism, notions that were deeply subversive for the age were all circulated in print, uh, it was in a way understandable that many people should regard it as worrying. But I think it's fair to say that we probably, and you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with the historians having value judgments as long as they accept that they are value judgments. We would say that it was probably a good thing that the pre existing patterns of, no of knowledge control collapsed in um, the early modern period, and that that collapse of those pre-existing patterns of knowledge control was crucial for a whole host of developments. It varied by culture. In some cultures, it was, it was more insistent than others. And it's no accident, if you think about it, that the place where the press, freedom to publish, is freest in the 18th century are the British Isles, Hamburg, and the United Provinces, what we would call the Netherlands heavily urban societies where the local political authorities are weak. Hamburg is an imperial free city. The United Provinces uh, was in effect a republic which was, uh, with, uh, which was a federation of cities. So what I would suggest to you is that there was an association between a degree of freedom and a social and political patterning in which there was this volatility of ideas which frightened conservative commentators, but nevertheless was probably for the best. It is possible that's where we are at the present moment. It's not going to be easy for anybody, even an authoritarian society of the nature, let's say modern Iran, it's not going to be easy to put everything back in Pandora's box, because the notion that you should express your own opinion um, is now really quite hardwired into societies. The pattern of the breakdown of deference, the, back, the pattern of the breakdown of hierarchy is all quite hardwired in. 
So what I would suggest to you, and I realise I've used up my time, but what I would suggest to you is that far from arguing that we are in a situation of crisis, we should accept that there has always been in the dissemination of news, in the way news is understood, a situation of volatility, a situation, if you want to use it in intellectual or academic terms, of ambiguity, of lack of fixedness, and that that very lack of fixedness is in part a quality of what, uh, for want of a better word, we could regard as intellectual freedom. Intellectual freedom to make choices which you and I might think are completely absurd, to express opinions which you and I might regard is completely abhorrent, but nevertheless, that, that is a characteristic of the human species. It may be concentrated on the pattern of, shall we say, in big urban masses of like ants, but we actually do not think like ants. Thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, for inviting me here tonight, uh, Shioko and, and the Dyer White Foundation for, for inviting me to come share my thoughts. Um, the title of my presentation is If All Mankind Minus One, Fake News and the Value of Free Speech. Um, when I was first contacted uh, to, to come and give a talk here tonight, um, the original request was to, to do a 20 minute presentation on the history and theory of free speech. Well, um, not even the most concise and succinct person, uh, I think, could, could do a history and theory of free speech in 20 minutes. So what I'd like to do this evening is, uh, is reflect upon the idea of free speech, reflect upon free speech, specifically in light of recent debates concerning uh, so-called fake news, and try and put fake news and some of these, these issues into some historical context, if I could. Okay, so... The usual disclaimer applies uh, with, with, in the sense that what I'm going to say is, is very much a sort of reflection, work in, work in progress. Uh, so please do ask questions and, and give me your comments afterwards. So I, I thought I'd begin by, by talking a little bit about the, the problem of so-called fake news. Um, as I think there are similarities with, it, with uh, what has been termed the problem of free speech as well, and I'll talk more a little bit about that later. <coughs> Um, of course, the issue of fake news has been made particularly visible recently, um, given the, the prominence it's been given by President Trump and his, his campaign team and his administration. To be sure, though, I think fake news is, is nothing new. The popular press in particular has a very long history, going back to the late, eight, late 19th century, of playing fast and loose with the truth or the facts mainly in order to uh, maintain the interest of its readers, but also its advertisers as well. But the term fake news here is, of course, used to undermine the legitimacy of some forms of journalism, particularly news organisations that don't necessarily see eye to eye with the, the Trump administration. So you have CNN, uh, the New York Times, the BBC, the Los Angeles Times, and even the Daily Mail, all banned from White House uh, Q&A sessions. It seems that the press in the United States, a little like judges in, in the United Kingdom, are, are now being framed as enemies of the people, which is quite a turn up for the books. I think this is all very uh, distasteful, but I think it's all, it's, it's really important to remember that there's a, a long history of politicians and their, their spokespeople taking against the press when they perceive that the press or the journalist or the news organisation is not sympathetic to the official line that they want to, to, to generate. They ask the wrong questions or whatever. So in Britain we have, of course, the likes of Alistair Campbell. Uh, he developed a, a fearsome reputation for his treatment of journalists uh, who were critical of, of New Labour or Tony Blair. Before Campbell, of course, there was Bernard Ingham, who was Margaret Thatcher's press secretary. Um, some say uh, that Bernard Ingham was actually uh, the sort of precursor, if you like, of, of Alistair Campbell, although he very much uh, sort of doesn't appreciate that particular view. But certainly, Bernard Ingham would, would uh, seek to manage the, the way in which journalists um, would access the, the Prime Minister and her cabinet. And if they weren't 
sympathetic if they were going to ask the sort of questions that Mrs Thatcher or her cabinet might be comfortable with, then they would get short shrift. So Bingham, you know, he was hostile, like, like uh, Arthur Campbell uh, after him, was hostile to sections of the press. So it's nothing new, this notion of hostility. In fact, the notion of hostility, of course, is fundamental to that, our ideas about what journalism should do. The freedom of the press is based upon this notion of the fourth estate, journalists holding power to account on behalf of the public. We, we, we as journalists, we should scrutinise the, 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 the powerful on behalf of, of the, the public. So this, this antagonistic relationship, is, of course, is part of the foundation for the fourth estate. If this is the case, then why would we have a problem with Trump's diatribe against the press? Sections of the press always take against um, official sources, always take against uh, power. That's, that's their particular role, that's their job, that's their role to stand in opposition, of course. So why should be, we be surprised at, at Trump's particular reaction or response? Well, I think, I think the reason why many people are worried by such actions and such sentiments is because Trump's actions, in fact, were completely contrary to established norms and, and, and rules of behaviour. For the President of the United States to undermine the legitimacy of law of journalists from the New York Times and the BBC is actually breaking a long-standing uh, set of conventions and relationships that exist between news organisations and political power. Of course, there's the rough and tumble, there's the political sparring, but the normal routine in the relationship between press and politicians is one of collaboration. I understand that in Japan there is the Kisha Club, or Press Club, in which official explanatory documents are provided to members of the press who are in these clubs, and they, they, get, they gain access because of their membership in these clubs. Of course, journalism does hold power to account, from the Pentagon Papers to Watergate, to MPs' expenses, to the Panama Papers. Uh, there's a long history of investigative journalism as well in, in Japan, and um, stand most notable being the, the Tanaka scandal in the 1970s. But I think, fundamentally, the assertion that the press is somehow distant from power, uh, that it stands apart from corruption and misdeed and, 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 and powerful interests, on behalf of the people that it's there to serve, the traditional no notion of the fourth estate. I think this concept is one actually that's quite deeply flawed. Even though there's a long-standing conflict between political institutions, actors and journalists, the relationship between the two always tends to resolve itself into relationships that are mutually beneficial. Each side always has something to gain from these beneficial relationships. And scholars have given such processes numerous names. Erickson in, in, in 1989 talks about an exchange relationship. Lumner and Gurevich in 1981 talk about a mutuality of interest. And Mancini talks of a process of long negotiation between journalists and politicians. The history of journalism, I think, is generally the history of bargaining, negotiation, and even collaboration between powerful interests from the political positioning and power exercised by press barons like Northcliffe and Beaverbrook to the revelations of press collusion exposed in the Leveson Inquiry in 2012. Sections of the press have always been close to power. So the trend, rather than conflictual, tends to be one of cooperation between the two parties. And I think this is one reason why, in my view, Trump's diatribe against the press has been greeted with such hostility by commentators, particularly within the media because it goes against all previous conventions of press politics relations. Despite the antagonistic setting of the fourth estate, the press is supposed to play. But what of other types of, of fake news? Well, fake news is also seen as potentially corrosive of democracy because of its ability to mislead the public in matters of real significance and import. It's seen as such a problem that only this week, Facebook published guidelines, ironically in the British press, on how to spot so-called fake news. Amongst the helpful advice were be skeptical of headlines, investigate the source, check the evidence, cross-reference to other stories, and so on. Indeed, the BBC News website reminds us that this is sound advice. 
well known to journalists already, so BBC is trying to legitimise its own practice and, and say this is what we do at the BBC, don't forget it. Of course, the, the other problem with fake news, it's been suggested, is that it has a potential to corrode democratic processes. From Brexit to presidential elections, we are told that fake news has real significant consequences. And with the expansion of social media and the, the consumption of news online, real news, it is argued, is drowned out, or is being drowned out, by the noise of fake news, thereby undermining the flow of information that allows considered democratic debate to be made. In an article in, in 2016 entitled Blighting the Fourth Estate, Fake News and New Democracy in Foreign Affairs Review, Wesley Garner argues that free speech is important for democracies, but well-informed electorate are even more important. And of course, it's the role of the journalists, the professional journalists in particular, whose job it is to fulfill this role of ensuring an informed electorate. The role of the press is, of course, to hold power to account. Yet even when stark hypocrisies and outright lies are exposed in the press, there seems to be little meaningful response amongst the public. And I think this is the nub of the problem. I think if the recent rise in populist politics tells us anything, is that traditional political parties, institutions, and those with whom they are associated have, of course, lost their legitimacy. Institutions have lost their capacity to connect with and to speak to and for us. Institutions, of course, including the media. One might suggest that the press has always been held with some degree of scepticism by the public. Uh, and I think, but I think that the current legitimation crisis, with its scepticism of traditional forms of, of, of uh, journalism and traditional forms of politics, actually deepens this. In other words, I think it could be argued that, that the fake news, the era of fake news, is merely the detritus of a much deeper legitimation crisis going on today. So this is all quite depressing, isn't it? Um, what, does it what does it have to do with freedom of speech and the history and theory of free speech? Well, I think in many ways the debate about fake news relates to debates concerning free speech and its limits. Given the affordances of social media, individuals and organisations, of course, have power to disseminate misinformation, lies, propaganda and hate, as well as affording us the opportunity of responding to this in a more maybe progressive way. This is where I think it's useful to draw on certain free speech arguments. And the one I'm going to draw on today is one that's put forward by John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill wrote his book on liberty in 1859, uh, the same year that Dar Darwin's On the Origin of Species was, was published. This was at a time when England was undergoing significant social and political change. The extension of the franchise in the 1830s and the pressure to extend it further along with the, the repeal of the last of the newspaper taxes in 1855, meant that public life assumed a new sense of vigour as newspapers grew in number and in terms of their appeal to all walks of life. So not just, not just the, the higher echelons of society were reading newspapers. Newspapers appealed to all social classes. But Mill was concerned, and he was concerned about the widening of the franchise um, as more and more people could have a say in how society was run, in theory at least, there was a risk that such power might become overbearing, echoing de Tocqueville's notion of the tyranny of the majority. He was also concerned about what would later be called mass media, and its potential to impact upon individuals and on society more generally. In particular, Mill was concerned about public opinion, and how opinions are circulated within society and their possible effect on individuality and freedom of conscience. On Liberty, then, is a book that warns against conformity and asserts that modern societies can have great power and influence over individuals. It's not just the overbearing state that Mill is concerned about here, but also, as I've said, social pressure, the pressure to conform, the pressure even to keep silent when one's opinion might not fit in with the perceived general opinion. With regards to freedom of speech, well, I'm not sure that Mill would have, would have recognised this term. He often used terms like freedom of opinion, freedom of conscience, freedom of thought. But I think we can assume that he's talking effectively about freedom of speech um, during his time. And hence my title, the title, well, the beginning of the title, uh, relates to a quite famous quote that, that is, he makes in On Liberty, and it's, it's related to his, his justification for free speech. Mill says, and I'm quoting here, if all mankind minus one were of one opinion and only one person were of the contrary opinion, 
mankind would be no more justified in silencing that one person than he, if he had the power, would be justifying, justified in silencing mankind. Which, if you think about it, is quite a powerful, profound statement of, 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 of morality, if you like. If the entire planet was of one, one view apart from one person, then mor morally, the planet, the whole breadth of humanity would have no more justification in silencing that person than if the power was reversed. So how does Mill justify this claim? On what basis does he assert this? Well, firstly, Mill states that to silence an opinion is to assume infallibility. It assumes that the silencer is right, not only at the time of silencing, but for all times in the future. For Mill, this is a preposterous position. To assume infallibility is to embrace ignorance. Secondly, the censored view, or the silenced view, may contain some portion of the truth. And for Mill, the truth and rational inquiry are vitally important. They are the cornerstone of progress. So we must ensure that ideas are given the opportunity to be examined in full. And he states that it's only by the collision of adverse opinions that the remainder of the truth has any chance of being supplied. Thirdly, even if the opinion is true, if it is not contested vigorously and earnestly, he says, it will become a matter of prejudice, with little comprehension or feeling of its rational grounds. And finally, unless views are contested, they risk becoming a dead dogma, preventing the growth of any real heartfelt conviction from reason or personal experience. So Mill summarises his argument by stating that silencing the expression of opinion is robbing the hum human race an opportunity of exchanging error for truth. And they're giving, thereby giving us a clearer perception of the truth as it comes into conflict with, with error. So the notion that bad ideas should be tested in open debate has in fact proved uh, remarkably resilient, of course, as a basis for freedom of speech and, and freedom of the press. So this dictum, I think, has come under severe pressure in, in recent years. The debate surrounding the, the decision by the BBC to include former BNP leader Nick Griffin on Question Time in 2010 was a good example of the, the tension and the conflict that this debate and these ideas can, can generate. On the one hand, the view was that giving fascists a, a platform is a really bad idea, as this only spreads and legitimises hateful ideas. On the other hand, um, the view was that, that opened up to scrutiny, these ideas can be exposed as being weak, irrational, and hateful, and so on. And that is, that is ultimately how he, how he came across on the, on the television programme. Indeed, more recently, we've seen no platforming controversies. With some universities, with, sorry, within some universities, with Jermaine Greer and Julie Bindle being subject to such censorship or silencing or no platforming, depending on your view. And certainly Mill's ideas have come under severe criticism in recent years as he fails to acknowledge the range of harms that can be done by words alone. Hate speech, words that harm, are not really dealt with by Mill for the most part. He thought that only words that instigate violence should be subject to restriction. What about hate speech? What about speech that is derogatory and offensive? Mill, of course, says very little, as I say. So as someone who studies journalism, uh, past and present, and debates concerning the democratic function of the press and, and freedom of speech and its values and freedom of the press, I think that though it's, I think it's worthwhile defending freedom of the press and the notion of the fourth for the state in principle. It is a very strong and powerful and worthwhile principle. But I also think we should be very critical of it and, and, and constantly on our guard and, and be mindful of its, its significant limitations. Bearing in mind Mill's point about dead dogma, while the normative core of journalism, the fourth estate ideal, remains very resilient within traditional journalism, at least, we should also bear in mind that it has weaknesses and limitations, particularly when the context of the current, within the context of the current legitimation crisis. At the very least, in an era of fake news, we should keep in mind Mill's dictum that bad ideas are best dealt with by the exposure and, and their scrutiny. If we recoil from challenging established norms, even of journalism, and I mean for the state, then we run the risk of closing off all opportunities for printing the worst of ideas as well as waking the best, the, the most of the best ideas. That's it. Thank you.
thank you very much. My name is Luke Kobayashi, and I'm, this is a privilege for me to be able to come here and enjoy the professor uh, talking about uh, Japanese journalism and media. And may, maybe uh, my talk maybe slightly uh, takes a different angle because I will talk about the, um, the now of the Japanese media and journalism. Um, so, but uh, talking about history of Japanese media, when did it start? It started in 17th century Japanese Edo period, but perhaps a bit like uh, British media, and uh, in the beginning, Japanese newspapers were called Yomiuri or Kawaraban, direct translation is tile block printing or using clay printing blocks. And then they carried rumors, pure imaginations, just like this illustration of the Ningyozu, which means mermaid, or pro or anti-government stories. And modern newspapers began uh, for foreigners uh, and then foreign news. I think this is also similar to the development of British or English newspapers. And the titles were Nagasaki Shipping List and Advertiser, 1861, and the government created a newspaper called Kampan Batavia Shimbun, 1862. And then um, uh, it uh, evolved into the newspaper which carried both foreign and domestic news, Yokohama Manichi Shimbun. And at that time, there are two types of newspapers. One of them were, uh, was a large newspaper, all Shimbun, they dealt with uh, politics, political news, <coughs> and it, uh, played a, they played a vital role to democratize Japan and set up a diet. And because they dealt with political stories, they had uh, some pressure from the government. Also, another category, small newspaper, called Shimbun, for life-related issues and local news. And they are uh, now Yomiuri Shimbun or Asahi Shimbun, both of them were founded in late 19th century, and they began to gain some popularity. And government pressures began to fall on newspapers. For example, in 1920s and, uh, 1910s and 20s, at the time of the Taisho democracy, Taisho period is after Meiji uh, period, um, uh, the, uh, that was a movement to achieve democracy and liberal thinking. And then, of course, in 1930s and 40s, there was um, uh, going to be the World War II, so uh, government censored and controlled the Japanese uh, newspapers. And after World War II, because America occupied Japan, censorship continued. And it's only 1951, true sense of freedom of, of expression without the censorship started. <coughs> and this uh, constitution was, of course, came into effect in May 1947. Now, we have national newspapers like Yomiuri, Asahi, Mainichi, Sanke, Nikke, and regional newspapers. Uh, there is a category called the block newspapers, which is a newspaper which is uh, uh, printed uh, in several or a couple of uh, prefectures. And also another category of news, evening newspapers, they are uh, Fuji, uh, Yuka Fuji or Tokyo Sports. They are mainly for businessmen. But uh, uh, at the moment, Japanese newspapers, as in the case of uh, other Western countries, uh, Japan is not the West, but the other uh, advanced countries, newspapers circulation is dwindling. And two th in 2000, about, uh, there were about uh, 53 million copies circulating in Japan, but now, about 43 million, so 10 million copies down, and it's really continuing. And uh, just for your information, Japan's population is double that of Britain. But uh, most papers are subscribed and delivered to homes and offices. This is, I think, a major difference between Britain and Japan, because 90% uh, of the newspapers are subscribed and delivered to homes and offices. Uh, there is a really huge network of home delivery uh, scheme in Japan. Maybe that's the one reason, one of the reasons Japanese papers decline is slow, slower compared to Western newspapers. And broadcasting, 
uh, NHK, which is like BBC, began as the Tokyo Broadcasting Station in 1924, and the radio broadcasting started from 1925. So uh, BBC also started the radio broadcasting in 1920, so about the same time. <coughs> and the three stations merged into NHK in 2000, uh, sorry, nine, uh, uh, nine, 1926. And uh, during World War II, all news reports, newspapers, as well as broadcasting reports, became official announcements of the Imperial Army General Headquarters. And in 1945, NHK broadcasted show Emperor the surrender speech. So uh, from the, uh, uh, in 1950, under the Broadcasting Act, NHK became a listener-supported independent broadcaster. It's really like a BBC. But the television broadcasting began in 1950, whereas BBC uh, started television broadcasting from 1936, so quite uh, uh, early BBC started TV. And uh, internet media, most, the most popular news site in Japan is uh, Yahoo Japan news site, uh, which has some meaning because uh, Japanese newspapers, of course, they have their own website, but they don't carry everything. And so, because they set up paywalls, so lots of, um, you know, uh, long stories or analytical uh, stories, opinion stories, you can't read them on the website unless you become subscribers. I think it's a pity, whereas in, for example, in UK, you, if you read Guardian, you can read everything free of charge on the website. Maybe they're not doing uh, financially a good at the moment, but I think they're contributing to the greater cause, you know, the democratization and lots of um, information circulating in, in, in Britain. So I think it's really great. But the Japanese newspapers are so lagging behind about that they didn't want to invest in digital, uh, um, digital uh, distribution. Therefore, Yahoo Japan news website became uh, the most popular news site. And then also, um, in addition to Yahoo Japan, there are lots of uh, news new news website, the Huffington Post to Japan, but through the Japan also Newspeak, which is like a new startup. These new websites uh, over there, um, uh, some of the people who work in traditional Japanese newspapers or broadcasters, they move to these new uh, websites. So, so there is exchange of people and the new blood is going in. And as far as social media, LINE is very, very popular. Uh, Twitter as well. Facebook is not as popular as uh, maybe in Europe and America, but uh, Facebook is also quite popular. And uh, judging Japanese journalism, level of uh, press freedom, there is a very famous press freedom index every year um, released by this uh, Paris uh, headquartered reporter, San Frontier, and Japan's ranking keeps falling in recent years. And um, uh, it used to be 2006, 51st, and 2009 it became 17th. And this is uh, what happened was, was that uh, in 2009, Minshito, uh, that uh, it used to be the biggest, um, largest opposition party, which does not exist now, but uh, Minshito new uh, party uh, was the government. And then it took a um, very open door policy. For example, when there are press conferences, um, media people, journalists who didn't belong to like, Shack Club or newspaper associations, they were able to get in. Uh, so they took open door policy. And then 2011, there was a big earthquake. And th that was a sort of a key time that the uh, uh, people in Japan, as well as people, some observers of Japan think there was some um, decline in trust in media. And then <coughs> suddenly, from 2012, it keeps going down. And according to this organization, the Japan's ranking fell because other government bureaucrats harassed journalists. I don't really feel, I and also other Japanese journalists living in Japan or in here, we don't really think uh, our uh, press freedom is curtailed or shrunk, but, but uh, uh, that much. 
but uh, that's what this organization's decision is. And uh, I think Japanese media, journalism, have some challenges. First of all, business-wise, people don't really read print media any longer, newspapers or magazines or books. And then they don't trust the traditional media as they used to do. And uh, criticism of traditional media journalism going around via social media, and there is this word called masogomi. I don't think maybe uh, not much there now, but uh, masogomi means, mass means mass media, and mass, mass media is trash. That's what it means. And it's been uh, sort of a keyword in uh, social media. And uh, as far as broadcasting is concerned, perhaps in comparison with this uh, British UK broadcasting, I, I think there is a lack of public service mindset in broadcasting. Uh, the reasons are that commercial broadcasters have really strong positions. They are making lots of money and also lots of uh, dumbing down programs during early evening airtime. And uh, it's really um, uh, low class, I think, I have to say. And, but because they have big, bigger audience, they keep broadcasting them and prioritizing keeping corporate pro profits rather than viewers. And, uh, but the weak point of the Japanese broadcasting industry is that they are sometimes threatened by the government because government controls broadcasting rights, which is quite different maybe in America and also in UK because for example, in the UK, Ofcom, there is a third party organization which controls and regulates broadcasting rights. However, in Japan, the government controls it. So, so the Japanese broadcasting industry is in a little bit weak position, I think. And then um, both broadcasting as well as newspapers, they try to be overtly neutral or impartial in reporting. Therefore, sometimes some Japanese politicians attack newspapers or broadcasting saying that you are not, you are partial. So, and then a little bit wider context, uh, I, this is my view, maybe not uh, really 100% shared in Japan, but this is my view of the uh, army in uh, Daily Yomini, which is English language newspaper of Yomini Shinbun for about 12 years, and I have been uh, writing news stories for Japanese media for the last 15 years. And uh, the characteristics are that they have old-fashioned way of thinking. And for example, respect for the old and respect for the authority. Respect <coughs> for the old is, is in itself is not a bad thing, of course, but if you respect for the old authorities and then they just accept what they say, just because they're old or just because they're authorities, I think it's going against the journalism. And also this word, um, uh, Japanese word, sontaku, uh, there are lots of uh, translations, but I translated it as guessing what others think and treading carefully. Of course, that, that is really not good for journalism, and not embracing digital revolution, and not accustomed to asking or being asked challenging questions and hypersensitivity for being polite or impolite. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I have a couple of examples. One of them is an example of Ms. Hiroko Kuniya. She had been a very good journalist in the NHK's very good um, current affairs program for about more than 20 years. But um, we don't know really sure the truth, but uh, People say they, she had to resign because of pressure from the government. However, uh, in itself is of course deplorable, but what I noticed was that I read an article uh, written by Ms. Kunia, and she uh, wrote about her experience uh, as a newscaster for NHK. But one of the things she said was that when she asked good questions, challenging questions, viewers always complained. Not the viewers. So, so I, I think viewers prefer some quietness. And sometimes being quiet is okay, but being quiet to the authorities, I think it would, uh, could be damaging effect to finding out the truth. And also, uh, example of minister at press conference. I think he was a, a 
he already was sacked or resigned, but he was minister of reconstruction of the earthquake in area, Tohoku area. And then uh, at one a press conference, he was asked by some ja one journalist a question, a couple of questions, persistently. It wasn't really um, impolite or anything, just uh, asked three times or something, and then he lost temper completely, and he was uh, he walked off and he said really nasty things to the journalist, and eventually <coughs> he resigned or, or sacked. But I, I thought, everybody thought that uh, um, this minister was really crazy, but I thought that maybe this minister is not really used to being challenged by journalists, which is really pity. And then the example of Buzzfeed. Buzzfeed is a new news website in Japan, uh, of course, originally from America, but uh, to my big surprise, Buzzfeed reporters wanted to attend the Tokyo government's press conferences, but they couldn't because they are not, they are outside the press park. They don't belong to press club in Japan. They don't, they are not uh, part of the major traditional newspaper uh, media. I was so surprised because here in London, it is extremely easy. I, I, I used to go to uh, London mayoral um, press conferences. You just go to the place, and then you just show your identity, and you say you're the place, and you can get in. You don't have to book anything. You just can get in, because press conferences for the... It's not so easy in London, Oh, yes, <laughs> except that, that kind of thing, yes. But basically, this is sort of a very basic governmental press conferences. You just can't go. It's very... Amazing! It's very old-fashioned, I think. And uh, and then the wider issue, uh, not directly related to media, is no viable position political party. And the media seem to be not willing to become such a power. To media are not really thinking of giving government pressure to find out the truth. It seems to be they are a little bit following. And the population is declining in Japan, so. Uh, in society, a lot of freshness and the power and dynamism. And thinking about Japanese media and power, during World War II, Japanese media cooperated with the Imperial Army to portray positive pictures of war. It became part of the government propaganda. I'm afraid I, I'm not so um, familiar with this um, detailed evidence, so I just say this sentence and then we'll know the next sentence is that the uh, this, there is a huge distrust in media, and then the key incident was Tohoku earthquake 2011, because the, um, the government and the major media produced unreliable information, maybe cover up or prioritizing safety rather than releasing accurate information, and and uh, deplorably Japanese media were not able to go to some uh, quote dangerous zones quote uh, because. The media and the Japanese newspaper associations got together and they agreed not to go to some particular places, although there were some people there. So, but whereas in UK, I saw Channel 4 News and BBC News people go there. Of course, they don't seek permission from the government. They just go there and then sh film and then tell the truth. And so I think, you know, this is being polite and asking the signal from the government is really a minus to the proper work of Japanese, uh, proper work of journalism. And then the another factor of Japanese media power is conservative other government. Uh, some critics of Japanese media say they are too kind to Abe, and the media are not being able to help create opposition power, or NHK journalism might be weakened. That's what the critics say. And did the media do enough to make those power in account? I, I, Wonder. My last uh, slide is uh, um, can paternalistic Japanese media challenge the power in full? I think uh, from the things I have pointed out, I think some of your uh, some of the audience may agree with me that the Japanese media have a paternalistic, old-fashioned, I think, uh, nature at the moment. And even if you get rid of paternalistic. Can Japanese media challenge the power in full? And um, there are two answers. Maybe yes, if you say yes, positive. 
by continuing what they do, using the Tokyo Olympic game as a catalyst, maybe um, continuing investigating and reporting with international experience, because you know the um, uh, Panama paper documents, at least two of the Japanese um, traditional media journalists participated in that sort of coverage, and I think that kind of experience is really good for everyone. Uh, and then maybe growth in energy or special groups, or not only media coming of age, they do more um, very good journalism, or answer can be no, negative. Start with the traditional old fashioned journalism because it's DNA and keeping politeness and consideration, such as contact or avoiding confr confrontation and protected in the Japanese language only environment, being afraid of losing access to power. I don't know which way the Japanese media will be going, journey's out. But, but I sometimes think that the public may prefer paternalistic, polite approach to um, do some journalism. So therefore, uh, you know, I showed you some um, lanky press freedom. So I think there is a gap of um, uh, assessing the level of Japanese journalism in a Western way, and also the, also the Japanese that the Japanese public may want. Maybe there is some gap. That's what I think. Great. Well, thank you very much, all three of you. We covered a huge amount of ground there. Um,